So Kat, what do you think is one of the challenges of being a self-taught artist? Well, honestly, the biggest challenge is that it's a huge world and it's unknown and you're not sure where to start exactly. But that's why we have the stream for the five tips you can start with. <laughs> I think a lot of people, there's just too many choices because when I was in high school, I really was a self-taught artist in a way because I didn't have a lot of guidance and there was no internet. But the thing is now you go on YouTube and there's 50,000 videos on how to do gesture drawing. And I think a lot of people, that's really overwhelming. Now, what do you do in that situation, Jordan? Because I know when you were in high school, you were really learning on your own and you were watching some YouTube. Yeah, so I, um, well, I had some people around me, you know, in high school that tried to, you know, teach me some things, but what I did was I just found any avenue I could. So whether that be art books, I go to the bookstore and find an art book or something like that. I would go on YouTube and try and find the tutorials that were around in 2009, which weren't very many, but uh, I did the best that I could. And I tried not to put any excuses in my path because by doing that, I would only stunt my own growth. And I know that I knew that there are artists who didn't have access to YouTube who became these phenomenal artists that I looked up to. So yeah, and there's so many artists that actually I didn't even know they were self-taught until I started doing some research. Like I had no idea that Yoko Ono was self-taught. Some of you guys might know Grandma Moses for these really beautiful, lovely, delicate paintings of different communities. And there are a lot of artists who were pretty trendy, like Basquiat was a self-taught artist. And so self-taught artists are everywhere. And I think that it's a really great thing that now we have this thing called the internet that connects all of us together. But I do think it can be overwhelming because, okay, let's say you do find a tutorial that, oh, I really like this tutorial. This is a good person. This is somebody I want to learn from and everything. But still, even within one YouTube channel like ours, <laughs> there's so much to choose from. So Kat, how do you start with that? Where do you begin? Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I just find something I like. Um, when I was really trying to practice on my own, I was trying to find artists that I enjoyed their works, and I actually would try to imitate them, which is one form of practice. So back in the day, there was this thing called deviant art, and it's still up and running, but it's like, I guess, you know, it's valid. It's fine. You guys can use deviant art as well, but it was something I used more when I was younger. And there were just like these quote unquote deviant art giants, like these people who are super famous on deviant art. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I have always wanted to paint like Charlie Bowater on deviant art. She just draws these like really hyper realistic, mostly white women. Um, and I was like, oh, this shading's so amazing. The technique is awesome. So how I really wanted to start was imitating Charlie Bowater. That's at least how I started out. I think that's a fine place to begin because Honestly, you can learn a lot when you copy somebody's drawing or painting. It's sort of like a way to get inside their heads a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I would also say, because I know a lot of people look at Instagram. It's so easy. There's a million artists on there. But I would just say, you guys, don't only look at Instagram. Go mm -hmm. to, there's a website called smarthistory.org, which is basically the art history version of us. And it's free. And I would just not ignore all of art history because you know what? Artemisia Gentileschi, she's not on Instagram. So you're not going to find her unless you already know that she's there. So Jordan, what do you think are maybe the limitations of using Instagram to look for artists? I mean, most things I see on Instagram are always just current artists. I very rarely see like a Renaissance painting on there or someone trying to mimic that style. And so it's one thing if you're trying to do something specific like like the entertainment industry, but if you're trying to do something more like fine arts or maybe you know anything in that realm, it's a lot easier to find stuff from a lot of these different sources that one website like Instagram doesn't have. Um, and also with Instagram, you're relying on other people to post this stuff to inspire you versus some websites about history that has all the information that you could possibly want. Let's see, Neil is saying, I consider myself self-taught, even though I'm an art student. The program in my school just doesn't teach us anything. I have to take the initiative to learn by myself. 
that's really good that you brought that up, Neil, because you totally can be in an art class, but still feel that you really have to take your own initiative. I mean, Kat, did you have a really good art program at your public school? It was just okay. I mean, I was like impressed by the fact that we had an art program because a lot of schools don't. They don't usually focus on the arts. Very unfortunate. But yeah, I mean, most of the art making I did in high school was self-initiated. Let's see. Blue Wolf Spirit says, I think it really limits you to be self-taught. You only know and explore what you know about. You really need to interact with others to suggest things you may not know about. A lot of it's exposure, just putting yourself out there and exploring a lot of options. Because I know that if somebody hadn't really pushed me to try something new, I would still be oil painting. <laughs> like I wouldn't have done anything else because I would have thought that oil painting was the way to go. Okay, so tip number one is to maintain a daily sketchbook practice. Jordan, why do you think this is helpful if you're a self-taught artist? I mean, there's that old saying, practice makes perfect. And so when you're keeping a sketchbook and when you're constantly looking at the world and when you're studying it and uh, and actively pursuing all this knowledge, it's only going to make your work better. And I think it's a great way to get whatever's in, uh, in your mind on the page. And it also just helps loosen you up. So when you keep a sketchbook, it doesn't always have to be the nicest thing in the world that has to go on the fridge later on. It can just be, you know, quick and dirty and get your ideas out and, uh, it's like a little art diary. I mean, I think what I like about sketchbooks is that they feel so humble and I feel that they're a safe place for me to mess around and do really crummy drawings and I don't have to share them with anybody. And there's something really nice about having that private space to just screw up and not post it on Instagram for everybody to see. What is your sketchbook to you, Kat? Um, it's definitely just a place to think. It's not something I pull out to show off because most people wouldn't get it. <laughs> Honestly, a lot of my sketchbook is also just written notes. So if I have an idea or if I have a technique I want to try later, I write it down so I don't forget it. So it's also like a memo. It's a very personal document. Uh, Joanna Mallon is saying, should you still do your daily sketchbook practice even though you're working on a big piece? I mean, I think it depends on your focus and your schedule, obviously. But Jordan, what would you say about frequency in a sketchbook? Is it once a week? Is it every other day? What would you suggest? I would do it as much as possible because just, I mean, sometimes I notice when I work on a larger piece or something that I'm really focused in on, I get tunnel vision. And I only think about that one thing, whether it's that style or that color scheme or whatever. And to break out of that sometimes is really, really helpful just to Sometimes I even get bored or sometimes I just need something different to inspire the creative juices, if you will. I mean, the way I think about a sketchbook is it's like primordial soup. Nothing is done yet. Things are generating and subdividing and dividing. And I just like that idea that things are percolating in that sketchbook. And oftentimes one of the ways I like to get ideas is I go back and I look at my old sketchbooks and then you jog your memory like, hey, that was a really cool idea I came up with a year ago and maybe I'll bring that back. And so really, it's almost like an archive of your thinking process and your brain. Like, Kat, I know you write so many stories. Have you ever done that, like gone back and looked at what you've done? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. My previous stories inform my current stories, too. And also, sometimes you just like go in and you're just like amused. You're like, wow, I wrote this like I'm <laughs> it's sort of like rediscovering a new writer um, when you go back and you look at your new like the things you tried, the things you knew didn't end up working out. Um, and it's cool to, to just learn from that. Let's see. Saad says, I sometimes find it difficult to distinguish between sketchbooking and making a full piece. Saad, I think sometimes for me, it has to do with the scale because I have this little tiny sketchbook that I carry in my purse all the time. It's literally this big, okay? And I remember there was one time we were shopping for Halloween costumes for my kids and this was like the trip to the fabric store from hell. Like we could not get out of there. And I was waiting in line for them to cut fabrics. I was so pissed off. And so I just whipped out this little sketchbook. I made these crummy sketches of these women that were waiting in line to cut fabric. 
And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to show this to anybody, but this made me feel a little better. So I think that sketchbooks can come up at a time that you don't expect them to. And that spontaneity, I think, is really, really important to have. Okay, let's look at tip number two, which is practice a lot. And Jordan, I think you sort of win the prize for practicing a lot because tell everybody here what your driving exercise has been to get yourself to work. Yeah, so when I was uh, when I was like 13 or 14, I met someone he, uh, who's an artist who I looked up to. I'm still friends with him today. And he challenged me to do 2,500 drawings, which consists of 1,000 heads, 500 arms, 500 legs, 250 hands, 250 feet. Now I've done that twice in my, uh, you know, in my artistic career uh, as far as I can remember, and that takes a long time. It takes about, you know, if you're diligent, about a year to finish. And what that does is it actively forces you to uh, get rid of your artistic weaknesses. So I, you know, at first I struggle with drawing hands, but guess who doesn't struggle with drawing hands anymore? You know, <laughs> and um, so taking those weaknesses and putting a number to them, I think will. Uh, will oftentimes just result in your work being so much better. And it's sort of, um, it's almost simple when you when you really think about it. Like, it's really not that hard to come up with these sort of challenges, but it's the dedication that's required. So you have to put in the work. There's no getting around it. John Keevan is asking, how do I find the drive to paint? Well, John, I would say you could do the painting version of what Jordan's saying. I don't think you should paint a thousand paintings because that doesn't sound very sustainable. But I've seen a lot of people do this exercise, like a painting a day, where you just commit yourself that every single day you're gonna make a painting, but it can be small. Like you could just buy a bunch of little tiny canvas boards and just have your paints out and available and you sit down and you do that. Cause Jordan, I think what I like about your thousand drawing challenge is that it's really concrete and it's defined because like cat if i say to you cat go draw like like what are you going to do with that it's so vague and i feel like the numbers it, it's a really specific goal you know when you finish you got the satisfaction of that and it keeps you on track because it's not too complicated you don't have to think so hard so like cat how do you find motivation to make work because that is a problem for a lot of artists right well, I think, first of all, I try to um, dedicate a certain amount of time. It could be 10 minutes. It could be several hours. But so long as I have a time frame in my mind, I can start to draw. Because something that really distracts me is if I have to do multiple things at once. So I find that when living with my parents, that's really hard. because, <laughs> Or having a kid, that's even worse. <laughs> but um, Anyways, if you're like drawing and then my mom's like, Catherine, come take out the trash. And then I have to go take out the trash. Well, I just like, I don't know. It's just like my mind has like flitted somewhere else and I can't focus on drawing anymore. So just like in my mind, I think, oh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes drawing, I'll do it. And the second thing I do is I make sure to just start because starting is really the hardest part. <laughs> I'm just sitting down and having the materials and just doing it. And once I start, I can find my groove eventually. Another option, you guys, is I've been doing these live drawing streams, which have been so much fun. They're part of the Anatomy for Artists series, and a lot of you guys are drawing along with me, which is so much fun. But also people will watch it later and draw along. And the super cool thing about that, you guys, is that if you want to show us what you're doing, tag us on Instagram and use hashtag ArtProfShare because it's really fun, especially in the Discord server. Everybody posts, there's a channel that's dedicated to that particular practice. And it's so motivating to see what other people do with the same prompt. I mean, Jordan, I know you went to art school, but how does that make you feel when you're with a group of people, you're all making the same thing, but you get to see the reaction that everybody has that's different? You know, it's... I love the camaraderie of just being together for one. And then that reaction, it's so, uh, it's so pure. It's something that's so unplanned and just seeing how everyone, t it's sort of like when you, when a group of friends go to see a movie together and maybe they're all different personalities and you see everyone has a very distinct reaction to each line or each scene that's, uh, that's done on the screen. And uh, there's something that's, that I really appreciate about, about that and you can't really escape it. Let's see, S. Schooler says, what advice would you give for people who are perfectionists 
especially in the sketchbook. I know it's meant to be practice and all, but how do we get the mindset it is a sketchbook? Kat, do you have any advice for that, changing your mindset? Maybe redirecting it into a new route. Like if you draw something and it's not perfect, maybe the perfectionist in you will be like, okay, next time it will be perfect. And it will encourage you to draw again. (laughs) But yeah, I think that's like... I think every artist in some way or form is a perfectionist. Um, And it's just in how do you want, what what area do you want to be perfect in? What do you want to focus your perfectionist attitude on? And yeah, I think that's actually a really powerful tool to have. It's just to be stubborn and constantly keep working on something. Just maybe like think of if you're focusing too much on one piece, maybe you can move on to another one, just like redirecting. All right, let's move on to tip number three, which is to explore as many art media and subjects as you possibly can. Jordan, why do you think that's important? Because what if I'm like, oh, I'm an oil painter. I really want to get good at oil painting. So you would think, okay, you should just oil paint as much as you possibly can. So why would a painter want to pick up a hunk of clay and do sculpture for a little bit? So I really... Uh, struggle with this I'll be honest there are certain times where I just want to do one thing and I don't want to do the other and it ends up showing in my work and really what ends up, and I think what ends up happening is certain media informs the other so I was taking a digital painting class for example a couple of years ago and we were turning in our finals and uh, some of the students were not as adept at drawing as they were painting and when they're coming up with things on their own and not you know uh, having reference and stuff it shows you can tell when someone doesn't have good drawing skills in their painting. And so I would say the same thing applies to sculpting and, you know, oil painting versus drawing anything else, because they all kind of merge into each other and you really end up limiting yourself when you don't practice something that you're, you know, that will, you know, will benefit you in the long run. I mean, I'll tell you guys, I went to graduate school to study sculpture with the intent to make my painting skills better because I felt that the figurative paintings I was doing at the time, they just felt so flat to me. And I wanted something a lot more tactile that I could engage with. And you know something, I actually stopped painting and now I'm doing drawing and printmaking and sculpture because I realized that that was actually a better material for me. And if I had never stepped outside of oil painting, that would never have happened. And so I think sometimes People have perceptions of certain things. Oh, no, I'm not interested. But if somebody gets you to try it, it's like, oh, that's sort of cool. Like, I think sometimes we have assumptions about sculpture or printmaking that are not necessarily accurate. Like, Kat, when you were in art school, did you ever have to do a material that you were like, oh, I don't want to do that, but actually ended up being okay? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I went to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. So the very first year of RISD, they force you to work outside of like your comfort zone and not like with materials you're totally not comfortable with so my first year at RISD I was like doing woodwork and I was like I've never touched a saw in my life (laughs) and here I was like being forced to make an instrument (laughs) and I think it really it was like cool I really enjoyed the experience and I learned that 3D materials don't scare me as much as they used to and I think it also helped in terms of like outside of the box thinking like oh I guess I can't just focus on like proportions and people and drawing, and drawing for now I have to think about how this like instrument will, will work <laughs> and it's just like a totally different part of my brain and it's interesting because it's all art it's all art design all creative but it's just such a huge world it would be such a shame for me not to explore it for sure I think that you just don't know until you actually start doing it. And you know something that helps me? If I'm, say, an oil painter and somebody makes me do a 3D project, I think a lot of people, their first reaction is, oh my gosh, I'm so bad at that. I don't want to do it. But in some ways, I find that really freeing because I'm like, yeah, I'm a painter. I suck at this. Okay, <laughs> let's just do this. Like, Jordan, do you have any skill that you're like, yep, I'm not good at that? <laughs> like, any skills uh, like that? Actually- Actually, painting is still really difficult for me, uh, whether it's traditional or digital. I, I have files on my computer right now that are just practice, like portraits and stuff, because I need to work more at it. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely fall in that category. And that could apply for sculpture and a lot of stuff. I just like drawing. That's my favorite. So, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I just think that you'll discover things that you didn't know existed. To me, it's like if you were an athlete and you had really strong arms and you went to the gym and you only worked on your arms and you never exercised your legs, like that would be bad. You would not be a very well-rounded athlete. And so if you think about just working on things that you're not as good at, I think that can be very helpful. Let's see, Sleepwalker says, I read the tip to just make at least one line every day. Once you sit down with your supplies and your paper, you're likely to be more motivated to do a bit more than just a line. That's so true. It's the starting part. I don't know why that's so hard. Once the pencil's in my hand and I'm touching the paper, it's okay. It's just that like <laughs> moment <laughs> before I touch the paper for some reason is so difficult for a lot of people. My chronic says how to adapt on drawing every day. I'm on art block mode right now. How to get motivated when overcoming through mental illness. Any tips to get back on top? Kat, what would you say to do? Because that is hard to do. It's not easy to have a regular practice. Yeah, I agree. I think also it's important to say don't completely force yourself. Learn to take breaks as well. Learn when your mind is um, not up for the challenge at the moment. And maybe you need to just like Netflix and just zone out for a little bit. <laughs> but um, I think the hardest part is honestly starting. But again, I think this is just something that practice will come about. You will eventually learn your rhythm. And that rhythm is very different from person to person. You can think about it almost like if you were a soccer player and you were getting ready to play a soccer game you're not gonna just play the soccer game. Most people will run a couple laps, they'll do a couple stretches. That's basically what you're doing. I mean, you guys are not gonna hit it out of the park every single right. time you sit down. I, Jordan, does that happen to you? Do you just pump out amazing work all the time? <laughs> um, no, that never happens. And very rare that I do. But, but one thing I did wanna say, like one of, the, uh, one of the reasons I talk about the 2,500 drawings a lot is because what it actually does while you're practicing and getting your you know, skills better, it actually rewires your brain so that you're more willing to, to do this, this thing that's difficult. And after a while, you start doing that over and over and over, it starts to become a, like a habit. And so that, you know, I'm, Claire's called me the ultimate drawing nerd several yeah. times. <laughs> and I think that's part of the reason why, because at this point my brain is wired to think that's part of my daily routine I have to draw. And if I don't, I get antsy and irritable. So, I'm dead serious. Well, oh, it's a drug. <laughs> Base Niji says, I enjoy doing abstract, almost naive painting, but previously thought I didn't have the right to do that until I was amazing at realism. That attitude killed all my enthusiasm. I don't think that that's true. This school of thought that, oh, before you have the permission to explore abstraction or whatever you want to do, you need to learn how to draw a photo realistically. I don't think that's the case. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, do I need to learn all the anatomy first before I start experimenting? I'm like, no. I'm like, do you want to do anatomy? They're like, no. I'm like, then don't do it. <laughs> it's so specific. And why bother with something that you really have just no interest in at all? I know that sounds like a contradiction because we just told you guys to try different media that you were uncomfortable with. But really, if something is that far off, sometimes it's just not uh, useful. Let's see. Um, Neil is saying, oops, sorry, I, I missed this comment. That's back here. Um, Neil saying, I'm still having trouble sharing my art. I've made progress, though, because I used to hide my stuff from others. I still feel uncomfortable. This is why I don't post my stuff online. Any advice? Kat, what do you think? Well, take your time. <laughs> I think um, once you find a piece that you're genuinely proud of and you want to share, you can share. But also like finding a good community, which we will talk about eventually, is also equally as important as making art, a community that you're comfortable sharing your art with. And you can find this community online somewhere, maybe like a Facebook group or art discord. Um, or you can find just like your circle of friends, like your family, like ask your sibling does this drawing look weird if you trust your sibling? Just finding a good group of people to share with, to start with. And then maybe eventually you can take that leap to, to go public. Well, I'll tell you what I really like about the Art Prof Discord. This is my perception. It just feels like a very safe space. People are not there to judge you. They're not there to look better the way sometimes they are on Instagram. I mean, Jordan, what's been 
your experience in the Discord interacting with people? Everyone is so uh, motivationally encouraging to each other. Like, let's say someone's posting a piece that they're struggling with. No one's going in there saying, you really suck, bro. I think you just need to, like, just figure something else out. I don't know if this is the path for you. No one does that. They all say, oh, I see what you're saying. Why don't you try changing the values, try changing the composition, you know, X, Y, and Z. And there are times where someone will post uh, an artwork like a day or two later, like a revision, and we're all mind blown, including the staff of, of our platform. We're just like, whoa, what the heck just happened? <laughs> And so it's always really awesome. It's always really great. Well, because I definitely have seen art groups online where people really don't care about anybody else in the group. And it's all me, 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 me. And I want to post my work. And that doesn't really work out so well. Like, here's an example. Yesterday, I reviewed some of the entries for the April Art Dare. And you would think that people would just show up and just look at their stuff and then leave. But you guys don't do that. I mean, have you guys noticed that during our streams, everybody here eggs each other on and you talk about, wow, you improved so much and I really like the way you did this. I mean, somebody just left a comment, I can't find it now, but they told Nicoletta that they really liked her piece from the art dairy yesterday. So I think we're a pretty special place online that you don't really see that often. So post in the Discord because I think that's a very safe space. And if somebody's a jerk, we'll boot them out. So don't worry. The Discord that we run, you guys, it's really heavily moderated. So don't worry about that. We'll do the best we can to stay on top of that. Okay, let's talk about tip number four, which is learn how to self-critique. Because obviously at ArtProf, we have a lot of options for critiques. For example, if you want to purchase a critique, you can do that. I know that's not an option for everybody, but you can also submit your work to get a free critique here on YouTube. And then of course, as we said earlier, there's lots of critique channels in the Discord, which are extremely active. I mean, there's stuff going on in there all the time, which is terrific. But the thing is, all of these are somewhat public, and I know sometimes you don't really want to put it out there. So self-critique can be helpful. So what are your tips, Kat, for how to self-critique? Mm, I think how I self-critiqued when I was younger was definitely imitating other artists. Like, what is this artist doing that I'm not doing? Like, is it the color? Is it, is it the composition? It's something about it. Um, and just like finding first artists that I liked in the works that I liked and then trying to imitate that. And also photo references also really helped in terms of just like getting proportions and anatomy right. Like I had, I didn't know why there was this portrait I did that was wrong. I was like, there's something about it that's wrong. And then I finally noticed when I took a picture of myself that like I drew a really sharp line for the jaw and like it's actually not like a sharp line. It's actually very smoothly like connected with the neck. And so it's just being really vigilant and finding different sources to see like what is making me feel a little bit odd. And those sources can be other artists. They can be other photos. They can also just be like friends and family who can just like point that out to you. But like be cautious of how you accept critique from people who don't know art because sometimes it can be helpful. Sometimes it can be totally opposite of help. Well, Jordan, how do you self-critique? Because you just finished your master's degree, which is very exciting. And you've been working on this series of characters for a long time. How do you know, like, yeah, that's that's the design. That one's really good. That's the one I'm going to go with. How do you reason through that? Um, you know, part of that is just um, getting other people's feedback and just figuring out like what's working, what's not. And for the character specifically, I really struggle with that. And I did you know, dozens and dozens of sketches for each and every one. And when it got to a place where I was happy with and I felt like I had challenged myself and I came up with a solution that wasn't in my mind before, uh, that I was happy with and I was happy with it. And I put it out to the world and everyone's like, this is really cool. Um, but in terms of, you know, everything else, there, there's something I noticed, like the first day of art class, like wherever you go, is always usually the most boring because it's always like the thing that's super basic. It's like, this is, you know, how you understand value on a, on a, on a sphere or a cube, or uh, this is a line quality. And honestly, as boring as they might be, sometimes those basics are incredibly important. So when I'm struggling with something, I'll say, okay, what's really the issue here? And I'll go like, well, the, you know, the under my understanding of form is completely off in this, pain, in this piece right here. So I have to go back and think about it that way. And um, there's some really great artists, um, Nathan Fouts, who works for DreamWorks, and he did paintings on like 
Prince of Egypt and Sinbad and stuff, he says he always goes back to the basics whenever he's struggling with something. And uh, I really think that's part of the key, understanding those and really making sure you replicate that every, every single time. Mia Pesis is saying, do you think it'd be better to master a certain skill like drawing before venturing into other mediums or should you constantly be dabbling in various mediums? That's challenging because I think there is such a thing as doing so many things that you feel totally scatterbrained. And I think we do like feeling that we have somewhat of control or mastery of something. On the other hand, I am the type of person when I get bored of something and I don't feel like painting anymore, I have to switch to something else. So I sort of feel like I'm the type of person I lose interest really fast. And so I rarely stick with one thing, but I have a colleague who does only lithography, nothing else. That she is an absolute master of that one thing. And I think you just have to know which type of artist are you? Are you really happy just going so deep into that material? Or do you want to be like me, like sort of a jack of all trades? But Kat, how do you deal with that? Because you are a very versatile artist. Like you do lots of digital stuff. You do comics. You do lots of um, oil painting as well. You have experience with that. How do you know when to focus or when to just experiment? Um, again, it's just from person to person, really finding your own, uh, I guess, like niches and also when to go outside of that. But I think something I always keep in mind is that you can never be totally perfect at any one thing when it comes to art, because it is a lifelong learning process, even though you're like, I got drawing in the bag. No, you have like, <laughs> you can always be learning more in that medium. And also like, while you're learning that medium, it's probably going to take you decades and decades and decades. Like it's a never ending process. You might as well try something else while you're at it. <laughs> well, I've had um, students sort of say things to me like when we do say a self-portrait assignment, they'll say to me, oh, I've done that before. I'm like, so you did one self-portrait and you're done? Like, I don't think that's a good way to go about it. I mean, look at Rembrandt. He was painting a self-portrait every month of his life. And so it's tricky because I do <laughs> think it's somewhat case by case. But you know what helps me, Mia, is... If I find that, okay, I'm really focusing on drawing for a little while. Let's say I draw for a month. If my drawings are static, they look the same for a month and I don't see any progress or any change, then I say, okay, it's time to take a little vacation. Let's do some printmaking for a week and then come back. Because I think there is something as getting stale with what you're doing. It's like too much the same all the time. Do you ever have that happen, Jordan? Oh yeah, um, there there are plenty of times where like, like if I'm just as much as I love drawing characters, there are times where I'm like, dang, I I don't even like drawing cars, but I'd rather draw a car right now, <laughs> you know. And and so that uh, getting that little taste of something different often improves my design. It also helps balance you out as an artist a lot more. It's sort of the example you gave about you know someone who only works on works out at the gym you, um, with their arms and none with their legs. It's just you become imbalanced and after a certain point, it shows and it actually ends up hurting you in the long run. Well, you know what I notice, you guys, is that sometimes I get all ambitious and I'm like, I'm going to cook a giant pie for my kids and it's going to be spinach and we're going to eat it for a while and oh, I won't have to cook for a few days. But you know what? It only works for two nights because by the third night, they're tired of eating the spinach pie and I have to switch it up. So it's sort of like you need that variety as stimulus to keep you going and doing something different. Rachel Diaz is saying, how do I get over a fear to create art? I usually do a realistic piece I'm really proud of, but then I take a break for weeks because I'm scared I won't meet my expectations. What do you think, Kat? Sorry, let me get this straight. Doing a realistic portrait for weeks. No, 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 then... doing a realistic portrait taking a break for weeks, like not drawing for a while a because they're worried they're not going to meet their expectations. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, like <laughs> when it comes to fear, you're really battling yourself. I think in this case, it is time to actually ask for other people's opinions and maybe encouragement as well. Again, post in the discord if you can. <laughs> but um, I think again, it's like also the same mindset as practice like you take a break for weeks it's hard to pick it back up again maybe if you just like put a paintbrush in your hand put some paint on it and then just like touch it to your canvas you might be able to start oh, start again did I answer the question well Sorry. I'm gonna piggyback on it a little bit and I'm gonna say <laughs> that I 
I think one thing that you can do, and this is going to be really hard, but you should really try because it helps get rid of those expectations. Because you know what a lot of people say to me is the drawing didn't come out the way I wanted it to. You know, I never have drawings come out the way I want them to ever. They're always a surprise. But sometimes it's a great thing. I mean, Jordan, do you have in your head what it should look like before you start a drawing? Um, I always want it to look good. I do know that. But as far as how I get to that path, how I get to that to that journey or on the way, it's always different. I, it's it's really really tough. It's very very rare that I end up getting exactly what I want all the time. And sometimes when I do that, I notice my drawings end up stiffer. Like even if I am drawing a character, sometimes I'll just go off the top of my head and say, "Oh, I'm going to do this." And then I look, I'm like, "Why is it not dynamic? Why isn't it fun?" You know. And I realized I was in my head so much that I ended up stiffing my own drawing and it made it worse. So sometimes you just have to get out of your head. And that fear is, I hate to break it to you, but it's almost always going to be there <laughs> if you're hearing anything from the three of us. That's kind of just how it is. It's the name of the game. It's just you don't want that fear to be debilitating where it paralyzes you and you can't really go forward. So Kat, I mean, do you have a vision of what you want when you start a drawing or whatever? Of course, like we all have dreams and aspirations and visions <laughs> when we start something. <laughs> but I think it's also good to have the flexibility in thinking, you know what, it might not turn out that way. And if it doesn't turn out that way, I really shouldn't beat myself up because it's not my fault. <laughs> um, I'm just I'm just trying to do my best here, you know? <laughs> but I think whatever the outcome may be, you will end up learning something. So it won't be for naught. And you guys, I really believe that there's no such thing as wasted time on your art. Because a lot of people, they think, oh my gosh, I don't like that drawing. That was a total waste of time because I didn't get the result I was looking for. I mean, I rarely do. But the thing is, that's time you spent engaging and thinking. And yeah, maybe you didn't get the results you wanted. But you guys, I don't knock it at the park all the time. I would say if I'm working on a body of work, probably only 20% of it actually gets shown. I did a series of self-portraits several years ago. And Jordan, I know you're going to think I'm lame. I did 50 portraits. <laughs> I know you did a thousand, but I did 50. And you know something? I didn't make 50. I made 65. Kat, why did I make 65 when the goal was 50? Maybe you just found your groove and you just kept going. <laughs> Partly is that, but also there was a learning curve. So the drawings that I did at the very beginning, they didn't match what was happening towards the end to the point that it was distracting. I mean, sometimes it's an okay thing, but I just would not set such high expectations because it's really, really unrealistic. It's very, very hard to do. Let's see, Annie is saying, do you ever ask yourself, why is painting so important to me? What keeps you piling canvas on day after day and to keep going at it? I don't know. I feel like some of it is some what compulsion, <laughs> but some of it's passion. I feel like there's a very fine line between the two. I mean, Jordan, what keeps you doing this? That's like asking a singer what keeps them singing, you know, uh, or, <laughs> or asking a chef what makes them want to keep cooking. And it's just a part of who you are at a certain point. Like I, I realized that I was born to be a creative person and this is the avenue I've chosen for myself to express that creativity. And now that I've wired my brain in such a way to constantly be thinking about art and drawing, I just can't let it go. And um, I, I often have like these, you know, these not quite nightmares, but like, man, what, what happens if my hand just locks up or you know, I, I get injured and I just can't draw? And I would just like, man, I can't even think about that because that would just be so miserable for me. And, uh, you know, so I don't ever have to really force myself to, to draw. Of course, I need breaks every now and then. Like the other day I was working on a project and I was so burnt out from, you know, finishing school, college and everything like that. And I was like, I think I need a nap. I'm going, I'm going to bed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, an, it's an intuitive thing. I can't really describe it. Saad is asking, how do you manage to keep your art the same style with different media? I often end up having totally different styles with certain mediums. Kat, what do you think about this issue of style? Because I hear a lot from younger students, like people who are 16, telling me that they're frustrated that they don't have a style and that everybody else knows what they're doing. What do you do with that? 
I don't think it's extremely productive to be like focusing on one style right now or trying to find your style because, well, you have like the rest of your life to figure out your style. Why lock yourself in right now? You can figure out, you can just try out different things. And ultimately what your issue is with the different styles with different mediums, I think ultimately if you're one person making all of this, it will end up looking like you made it um, regardless if you're like, actively thinking about style or not there's just something about I don't know it, it will look like the same person made all the work I'm sure but I wouldn't worry too much about style I would just keep focusing on trying to improve yourself in general in terms of medium in terms of style and in terms of like what you want to convey through your art I think that style should evolve naturally it should happen slowly over a long period of time I'm talking years and it should not be a decision. You don't wake up and say, today I'm gonna find my style. Here it is, <laughs> it's not that concrete. <laughs> and I think that when it evolves naturally, it's just much more genuine because I definitely have seen people I went to art school with who said, okay, what's trendy in illustration today? I think I'm gonna start drawing like that. And that does make people have careers. I mean, I know lots of people that do very well because they're just doing what's trendy at the time. But you know what? That's not a long term solution. What are you going to do when that illustration style is not trendy anymore? You're stuck with doing something you weren't really even that into anyway. So guys, cool it on the style thing. It's just not that important to focus on because really you should be focusing on other things. I mean, Jordan, did you ever worry about not having a style and feeling like everybody else did? Um, I Yeah, when I was in high school especially, I was really worried about that. And I don't remember who I heard it from, but I remember hearing that your style will come over time. And the way I, I think about it is like, let's say I'm making something like spaghetti, right? Everyone makes spaghetti almost the same way. You got noodles and you got sauce. Like those are like the two basic things you need. But maybe after a while, you, you're like, you know, I get, I'm kind of bored. Maybe I'll put some salt in there. Or maybe I'll put some onion. <laughs> you know, salt. maybe I'll put some garlic. Maybe I'll put, you know, and you just start adding things. A meatball or, or in my case, a vegan meatball, you know. And so I just, <laughs> uh, I tried different things out. And then at a certain point, it's like, it becomes your own. And it's really, really good. And even though it's still spaghetti, now it's your own. And I think that's the same thing with art. You know, it, it may not look the exact same as you were anticipating or as someone else's style, but over the influences that you have around you and adding your own personal spin on it, then I think your style will come out. And it's a natural thing. And it's not something like Clara said that you can just sit there and plan out. Like, it will take me four hours and 58 minutes to find my style. And then I'm going to figure out my coloring style after that. It's going to take another four hours and six minutes. You know, it's, just, it's not like that. <laughs> All right, tip number five is to meet other artists. And we're talking about in real life and also online. Now, depending on where you live, one is maybe more an option than another. I know a lot of people who watch us do live in somewhat remote areas. Maybe you're far away from a big city. In fact, tell us in the chat right now, do you guys find that you do have in real life options for artistic community or not? Are you mostly online to find that? But so Kat, why does this matter? Because ultimately, as an artist, it's so much about what you are doing. But why does this communication with other artists matter? Um, well, there are multiple reasons why I think um, one reason would just be to expand your horizons. Like this isn't just your world that you're living in. This world has many other artists as well. And it's really good to see what's out there. And another reason would be just like, I guess, mental stability. It's hard to know if you're the only person making art, you kind of feel isolated, you kind of feel like you're the one that doesn't belong. And so the biggest thing about community of a community of artists is just like, finding a place you belong, finding other people that like what you like and finding other friends, you know, so it could be just like to improve your art, it could be very for selfish, selfish reasons, but it could also just be like, I just need mental stability, I need that community. I feel like for me, half the reason I talk to artists is just to validate that I'm not crazy. Because I, I don't know if you guys have this experience, but some of the things that go through my mind that have to do with being an artist, I'm like, am I the only person on the planet that thinks this way? 
And honestly, the Discord is, I, I just love how nerdy we are. It's like somebody will be like, what type of charcoal pencil do you recommend? And then people come in and they're like, well, I find that the General's pencils get a little bit stiff sometimes, but I also tried Prismacolor and they're a little bit too soft for me. I love that kind of talk because if I tried to talk that way with somebody who was not an artist, they'd be like, what? Right? <laughs> Jordan, how has community helped you? It and you know honestly, there were times when I thought about quitting art altogether, and it was being around other people and seeing their excitement that encouraged me. And so, I I don't want to say I rely heavily on community, uh, but I do very much go out of my way to try and seek that out whenever I can. Uh, and now I've built up kind of this this army of art friends who I can go to. Uh, whenever I need some help or encouragement or things like that. Uh, some of them are on the art prof team, some of them are from school. And, and so it it's really, really helpful. And I find that when you have some just someone to talk to about these issues with art, it just helps you out so much in, in ways that you may not even fully understand. And also for accountability, because if you're being lazy or something, <laughs> they'll call you out on it. You know? Yes, because Jordan, that's a problem for you, right? Being lazy? Well, I, um, <laughs> I've been called out multiple times on stuff. And uh, like there are times where I post stuff on Instagram and maybe like one of my teachers or a friend will be like, dude, why'd you draw that leg like that? Like, come on, man, you know better. <laughs> and that's happened to me several times. And it's just, <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, it's really, really helpful for accountability purposes and for encouragement. And I will say with artistic community, just because somebody's an artist, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're good for you to speak to. Because I actually have a couple of friends I went to art school with who I adore as people and I love hanging out with them, but they're not a good fit for critique. I have very specific people that I'm like, okay, this person really knows what I'm trying to do. They're a good person for me to speak to. So you really have to find the right space because here in the chat, Seven Angelic Enigma says, all the artists I know are much older and accomplished, so I'm super intimidated. Yeah, I mean, if you were 15, you probably don't feel like you want to talk to somebody who has a 30-year exhibition history. Like, it, it just, you feel like you don't have a lot of relationship in there. And let's see, other people are saying, Leston says, I have trouble finding community. I'm on several groups on Facebook, but that doesn't work so well. And Ray is saying, I'm just a community which is about four people deep. I live in a town less than 2,000, so I go to the next town over. And John is saying, love the Art Prof Discord. The nerd discussions about supplies can be life. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad we can help you guys out there. And thank you so much to Amaris and John and Nikki for the super chats. We really appreciate you guys supporting us because we love you guys but it really helps us to have those resources. Monu Chan is saying, I also find healthy rivalry helpful with some of my artist friends. It's good to challenge each other once in a while and then talk about it. Do you have any rivals like that, Kat? Rivals? I mean, like all my artist friends are my rivals. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's also really important to learn to foster healthy relationships between artists as well, because you guys are ultimately going to try to help each other, right? Um, and if anyone's really toxic or just like, I don't know, bullying you in any way or form, it's good to also cut that out. So healthy rivalry. <laughs> you know what you can do, though? This is what I did. If you're jealous of somebody, make friends with them. It fixes everything. Because... Yeah. <laughs> There's um, Kathy Speranza, who used to teach with me at RISD, and she's somebody who I am just intensely jealous of. She's basically the oil painter I always wanted to be, but will never be. And I get mad when I look at her work, but then I can't be mad because she's my friend. So it's like, okay, somehow. I don't know. It's hard to find those relationships. But when you do, it's great because she and I have had such great conversations. She shot a tutorial for us that I'm hoping to get done by the fall. So it's a really good thing to think about that. Jordan, do you have any healthy rivalries? <laughs> oh, all the time. That's like, so for those who don't know, I, I came from the games program <laughs> I'm at my school. And just by the nature of games, there's always that little level of competition. And uh, 
we had something recently called the Spring Show, which is this big art exhibition for all the students. And uh, I placed uh, second in the cat character design category, and the number one slot went to a friend of mine who I actually sat next to the entire semester while we were working on the projects that won. And so we, when we found out about it, we both like kind of go like, oh, that was awesome, that was, and we just kind of pushed each other and encouraged each other even while we were making it. And uh, Ian got inspired from each other, like, oh, that's a really cool design motif. I'm going to copy and paste that on mine and change it just a little. And so <laughs> we would just, we just feed off each other like that. So it was great. And by the way, you guys, if you're an oil painter, don't limit yourself to only talking to oil painters. Talk to people who work in different creative fields. Like Jordan, I would say you and I could not be more different as artists. You do digital stuff. You're focused on character design and story. And I'm very fine arty by comparison. But I know through these streams, like I've had such great conversations with you guys about stuff that I just don't think about. Like Kat, you did that character design tutorial and I learned so much from that. So Kat, why do you think that's valuable to talk to somebody who's in a totally different area? Again, just to expand your horizons, like you're not the only artist in this world and talking to other artists is going to help you in the long run as well. Um, I also, I just like, I don't know why, I love showing my illustrations to my non-illustration friends who are still artists. Like I have friends who are architects. I also have friends in like furniture design and jewelry and metalsmithing. And they don't do what I do, but they still are somewhat in a similar mindset in that they're still thinking of art and design and being creative. And when I make an illustration and they like it, like my architect friends love it. I'm like, I feel like I've accomplished something. Like I felt like I've connected with someone else with like a medium I'm used to, but they aren't, it's still a little foreign to them, but they still are able to like connect with me, if that makes sense. Guys, we have an art prof share to show you guys today. If you don't know what this is, basically, if you guys watch one of our videos and you create artwork, any artwork you want, in relation as a response to that video, we might give you a shout out here on YouTube. So today we are looking at an artwork by Alexandra, who is from Poland. And if you guys go down to the video description below, you can read Alexandra's full artist statement. And Alexandra is 15 years old and she's a self-taught artist, perfect, that we are featuring her in today's uh, Art Prof Share. And she says she watched our tutorial on self-portrait drawing in crayon. And she says she really enjoyed the clarity of the tips. Drawing people has always scared me away. It seemed to be difficult to do properly, but your tutorial did the opposite, encouraged me to try it. And I was not disappointed. I think the technique was not only surprising, quick and effective, it's also simple and I could still have my own space for my own expression. So she talks in here about playing with different colors, leaving a strong contrast between the black background, different colors to express her inner self and emotions, cold dark colors on the left to represent her deeper personality, but warm bright shades and characteristics in others. She said drawing the nose and lips was really challenging, but thanks to the tutorial, learned a couple perspective tricks and is going to try to work on them with facial proportions. So Jordan, what's your take on Alexandra's drawing? You know, I, I really like the part in the artist statement where she mentioned that drawing self-portraits was something that was intimidating at first. And then not only does she do it, but she does it with these really wild colors. And I'm like, wow, you just kind of you, you just jumped the whole level uh, there. And I think that's really awesome. I love the uh, the bright saturated uh, blue shadow that you have and then how that's mixing in with the uh, the colors in the cheek and the pink and yellows and stuff. It's very hard to get all those colors to uh, work well in a succinct manner, but I think you did a really great job. Kat, what do you think about Alexandra's drawing? I mean, I also have similar thoughts to Jordan. I also was surprised when she said she struggled with the nose and the mouth because they do look natural in the piece. But I will say that the most striking element would be the eyes for me. <laughs> Maybe it's like the really big pupils in the middle, but like those are definitely eye catching. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say I love the shadow, the blue shadow on the left hand side. That makes the portrait for me because lighting really is what helps you define the form. And I love how in that area, the shadow has so many transitions. Like on the forehead, it goes from like purple to pink to orange to green. 
And those are all colors that you would not think would go into a self-portrait. And so I just love how Alexander was so bold about the color because a lot of people are afraid to put somewhat crazy colors and they think, oh, well, it just needs to be earth tones and just do that. But I think really, Alexandra, you embrace those colors so, so well. And we're so excited to see the results of that. And if you guys have an art prof share, you can go to artprof.org, click on tutorials and project ideas. There is a purple button on the left-hand side that will take you to the art prof share submission form. So you want to submit there for our YouTube shout out, or if you guys just want to show us and you don't want to submit, just tag us on Instagram, use art prof share, because we love seeing what you guys are doing. Like Kat, how does it make you feel to see that somebody has actually made something in response to our tutorials? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like a warm and fuzzy feeling in my heart <laughs> because <laughs> we bothered to put something out there and the fact that people are receiving and doing because of it is just really rewarding. It's like my art prof soul, it just surges. It's just the greatest <laughs> thing ever. I love it, you guys. All right, guys, if you are not in the Discord channel, let's peer pressure you to join because all the cool kids hang out there. The link is in the video description below. So we hope you guys will join us and subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. Those of you guys who tuned in the chat, contributed to the discussion, thank you so much. You guys make this such a great experience. Everybody, please stay safe. We'll